This is a photograph of Vincent van Gogh about the age of 18. As I mentioned earlier, Vincent's brother Theo showed the work of Gauguin his gallery, and when Vincent arrived in Paris in 1886, they met. Theo, the younger brother, and Vincent were the sons of a minister in the Protestant Dutch Reformed Church in the town of Grootzundert in Holland near the Belgian border. Like Gauguin, Van Gogh was no child prodigy and did not start painting seriously until he was in his late twenties, and since he died at thirty-seven he was to have a very short creative life. Among great painters, perhaps only Peter Bruegel's was as short. He received a typical Dutch middle-class education and then got a job as a clerk in the art firm of Goupil and Company, the Sotheby's, the Christie's of its day. His uncle, also named Vincent van Gogh, was a part owner, and that is likely the explanation for how van Gogh came to work for this company. Between 1869 and 76, he worked in their offices in The Hague, Paris, and London. In 1876, he left Goupil's, planning to become a theology student, but this didn't work out, primarily because of his disagreements with the teachers over both lifestyle and doctrine. He was, however, given a provisional post as a lay preacher in a poor coal mining town in Belgium, but his insistence on leading a life of nearly absolute poverty and more or less ignoring church doctrine and law caused his provisional appointment to end after six months in July 1879. His earliest paintings, like the farm scene here of 1883, date from slightly later than this, but they are full of the melancholy of the coal mining district and are representative of his early dark and somber style. This is another example from this period. He was becoming disillusioned with the organized church by this time, and this was at least in part what led him to begin fitfully studying art and leading a bohemian existence complete with being thrown out of traditional painting classes, having an unwed mother who was a prostitute as a roommate, causing the attempted suicide of another lover, and getting treatment for venereal disease. His most famous picture from this period is the potato eaters in the Rijksmuseum. In a letter to Theo written in 1884, some months before he finished this, he wrote that he was having a hard time knowing what Impressionism was all about, since he didn't know any of the painter's names his brother was mentioning, and he hadn't seen their pictures. Certainly nothing Van Gogh had painted to this point would remind anyone of Monet Pizarro or Renoir. His friend Emile Bernard called this picture remarkably ugly. About the time he painted the potato eaters, he painted the still life with the open Bible. The other book on the table is one of Zola's Rougon Macar series called Joie de Vivre. In a letter to one of his sisters, he wrote, The work of the French naturalist Zola Flaubert, Guy de Maupassant, de Goncourt is magnificent. Is the Bible enough for us? Joie de Vivre contains a character who is Christ-like in her innocence and willingness to help, and the potato eater certainly does have something of Germinal, Zola's novel about the rigors of coal mining in it. However, probably not even Dreyfus himself would have compared Zola to Moses or Jesus. In early 1886, wanting to see for himself what Impressionism was all about, he moved to Paris, and Theo let him stay in his Montmartre apartment on Rue Le Pique. This is one of several views of Paris he painted in the year after he arrived. Here's the view out his window. Over the next year, he did meet Pizarro, Bernard, Toulouse, Lautrec, Cezanne, Seurat, Signac, Gauguin, and several others, and quickly gave up the dark colors of his Dutch work for the more colorful Impressionist and post-Impressionist look. This is 54 Rue Le Pique today. He met Bernard at the shop gallery of the fellow known as Père Tanguy, and Bernard says Van Gogh spent so much time in the place he practically lived there. This is Van Gogh's portrait of Tanguy. They shared an interest in socialist reform, and Bernard says neither one of them ever had any money. 
and Van Gogh would often trade pictures for meals. As I mentioned some time back, it was at Tanguy's that Van Gogh met Cezanne, never one to mince words, who told him straight out he was a madman. Van Gogh, in fact, never thought Cezanne's work was any good either. Per Tanguy, as you can see here, was also a collector of Orientalia and Japanese prints of the sort that influenced artists like Toulouse-Lautrec, Gauguin, and Van Gogh himself. That portrait and this self-portrait, made about the same time in 1887, illustrate the influence that Pointillism or Neo-Impressionism was having on him. In the summer of 1887, he made trips to Osnier with Signac and Bernard, and Signac was Seurat's primary disciple, and at this time Bernard was also painting in the Pointillist style, although he later gave it up for Clausenism, over which, as I mentioned earlier, he was to fight with Gauguin regarding who really originated the style. Osnier was another suburb painted by most of the Impressionists, including Monet, Pizarro, and Renoir. This is another picture which also shows how much Van Gogh was interested in the Pointless style, although he uses what might be called coups or strokes rather than dots. This is a picture Van Gogh painted of the restaurant de la Serene along the Quai d'Asnières near the river, and presumably he and Signac had some cheap lunches here. He also painted the inside of it. This is the way the view there looks today. The restaurant is long gone. The two sides of the river had distinctly different characters. This is a picture of the factories on the other side of the river at Osnier, but there's no gloom about it. Suzanne Valadon, the popular model, painter, and enamorata of Eric Satie I mentioned earlier, said that she met Van Gogh at a soiree chez Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec on the left of the Rue Tourlac here. Toulouse-Lautrec is himself, of course, one of the Mart Mart artist eccentrics who made the play so interesting in the late 19th century. He's best known for his posters advertising the performances of crowd favorites like Jane Evril, La Goule, and Aristide Bruant at places like the Moulin Rouge, which is still going strong. This is a portrait which Toulouse-Lautrec painted of Van Gogh. Valadon says Van Gogh would show up at Lautrec's with a painting under his arm, put it up against the wall, uh, apparently expecting comments, would usually be ignored and would then leave, having said hardly anything at all. In 1890, however, when Van Gogh's work was being shown with the Levant group and a fellow named Henri de Gru was harshly critical of it, Toulouse-Lautrec challenged him to a duel and then Signac stood up and said that if de Gru killed Lautrec, he would challenge him. The duel, in any case, never happened. This is a photo of Toulouse-Lautrec. He's most often associated as an artist with the commercial posters advertising places of entertainment in Paris which he made, but some consider Jules Charest, his friend and competitor, to be the real inventor of poster art, and Théophile Steinland made the famous Chat Noir poster. Toulouse-Lautrec's parents were first cousins, and there had apparently been a lot of intermarrying in the aristocratic family to which he belonged, which may account for some of his health problems. But he did also suffer from alcoholism and syphilis and died at 37. While we see some of the posters by them as well as some of the places they advertised, we're going to hear one of Offenbach's most well-known dance pieces, the Can-Can from Morpheus in the Underworld, or Feux Enfer. Offenbach owned the theater called Le Bouffe Parisien near the Opera House, and this is a poster for a performance of Orphe there. And here is Le Bouffe itself, which still exists. This is another poster by Jules Charest for a performance of Orphe. And the Moulin Rouge, which was Toulouse-Lautrec's favorite night and day spot.
Jane Avril was one of the stars of the cafe concert circuit. And here she is again. This is a photo of her. Dancing at the Moulin Rouge by Toulouse-Lautrec. A Moulin Rouge poster by Toulouse-Lautrec advertising the woman known as La Goulou, the glutton. And another by Toulouse-Lautrec, including a self-portrait. He's on the right in the group sitting at the table at the Moulin Rouge. This is where the Chat Noir used to be on Rue Rochoir. And this is Theophile Steinland's poster, probably the most often reproduced of all such things. This is a photo of Toulouse-Lautrec with Charest pointing to another Moulin Rouge poster he did. And this is another photo of Jacques Offenbach. Both Gauguin and Van Gogh left Paris a few months before the great Exposition Universelle of 1889, the centennial celebration of the French Revolution. It opened with the not-quite-completed Tower of Gustave Eiffel at the center. This is an aerial photograph taken from a balloon. At 984 feet, it was the tallest man-made structure on Earth when it was built. Since the government would only grant Monsieur Eiffel 25% of the estimated building cost, he struck a deal which would, if he arranged financing for the remaining 75%, grant him the total receipts from tickets sold to go up in it for 20 years, and he became a millionaire the second year. It was roundly criticized by many. It was said that even Americans wouldn't have wanted it. But it is, of course, now one of the most revered of Parisian monuments. Actually, one of the most popular exhibits in the whole expo was American, a full-scale model of the Venus de Milo made out of chocolate. It's interesting that much of the criticism directed against the tower was similar to that directed at the painting of Manet and the Impressionists. It looks unfinished. Among those who hated it were Charles Gounod, Alexandre Dumas, and Guy de Maupassant, who, however, ate lunch in the tower restaurant every day because he said it was the only place from which he couldn't see it. Among artists I've discussed, only Seurat, the most scientific, painted a picture of the tower. Cezanne's House of the Hanged Man was one of the few Impressionist or Post-Impressionist works on display in the Fine Arts Pavilion, but it was hung up so high it could barely be made out. There was nothing by Monet, Pizarro, or Degas. Manet was represented posthumously by the universally popular Le Bon Bach, and at the insistence of Manet's influential friend, Antonin Proust, by the universally startling Olympia. The gigantic gallery of machines was the largest vaulted building ever constructed and was devoted to the latest technology. It can be seen behind the Eiffel Tower in the picture we saw a minute ago. It was used again as we see the interior here for the 1900 Expo, but then torn down. This is Van Gogh's painting of Arl from a distance. So in February 1888, Van Gogh left Paris for Arl, but why he did so is not very clear. He was likely to some extent influenced by the popular local color stories of Alphonse Daudet, which he had read, and maybe more by the prospect of a warm, bright sun, which, as this picture shows, wasn't always able to prevent winter there. It's our all we see in the distance, as he first saw it. He probably came to Arles, too, for something like the same reason Gauguin went to Brittany, where he was again by this time, to get a fresh perspective, and to some extent just for the adventure and foreignness of the place. 
Relying on Theo's financial support, he rented four rooms in the so-called Yellow House, which used to be in front of the large building across Place Lamartine there. In May, he proposed to Theo that it would be cheaper, since he was also spending money to support Gauguin, if Gauguin were to move in with him in Arles. He also wrote to Gauguin himself, proposing that in addition to the financial advantages the shared expenses would provide, there would also be an opportunity to collaborate. Gauguin promised to come, but kept putting it off and asking Theo for more money. Van Gogh warned Theo that Gauguin was trying to take advantage of him and to be careful. This is the way the yellow house looked when Van Gogh painted it in 1888 and you can see the building behind it, which still exists. Van Gogh's rooms were on the right-hand side. In early October, Gauguin sent Van Gogh a self-portrait, the one known as Les Miserables, which we saw earlier and which changed Van Gogh's whole attitude to him. As I said when I was talking about this earlier, Van Gogh now began to regard Gauguin as a potential master. He uses the word abbot master, potential master, or abbot of a sort of communal group of artists, monks, which Van Gogh had decided would be the ideal arrangement in Arles to promote his and their work. In response to Gauguin's self-portrait, Van Gogh then sent this one of himself. Gauguin had said that his own was to be taken as a representation of the modern artist as a victim and yet as a hero on the model of Victor Hugo's Jean Valjean. Van Gogh described his self-portrait as, on the other hand, a picture of a bonze, a simple worshiper of the eternal Buddha. This treatment of the self-portraits is according to the analysis of them by Professor Deborah Silverman, who also thinks that Van Gogh, like Gauguin, was influenced by the work of the writer Pierre Loti, in particular, the novel Madame Chrysanthemum, which he had read a few months earlier and to which he referred several times in letters. In the book, Bonzes, more or less Buddhist priests, are represented as, according to Silverman, convivial, ceremonious, artistic, and anchored in nature. This is a bit of a scary picture, though. The fact that the whites of his eyes are the same color as the background make it seem like we're looking right through his head. This is Van Gogh's picture called The Soar in the Kroller Muller Museum. Van Gogh was, of course, himself often attempting to explain what he was trying to do in his pictures in letters to his brother, to Emile Bernard, to Gauguin, or others, although often what he says does little to really explain anything very well. One thing he certainly wanted to do, and this may to some extent have been Gauguin's influence was to use color to convey emotion. He also wanted to paint in such a way as to make the infinite tangible to us, as he said in a letter to Bernard. There's certainly something of pantheism in his attitude. He's trying in his pictures like this to paint in such a way as to demonstrate the presence of divinity in the world. The operative word for him here is descent, the descent of spirit, God, into the world of matter, Whereas for Gauguin, the key word is ascent. He says his purpose is to ascend toward God through the medium of abstraction. Art is an abstraction, says Gauguin. Derive this abstraction from nature while dreaming before it. This is the only way of rising toward God, doing as our divine master does, create, he says. Animals and angels don't create, only God and men do. He painted another version of the soar, now in Zurich, which was probably a study for the picture we just saw. One has to be reminded by this sort of treatment of the peasant in these pictures of the monumental soar of Millet, whom Van Gogh did call his favorite painter. This is the Night Café, a widely reproduced picture, which he says was actually painted with an emphasis on the impact of the color also. I have tried, he wrote, to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. And in another letter to Theo, he says, In my picture of the night café, I have tried to express the idea that the café is a place where one can ruin oneself, go mad, or commit a crime. So I have tried to express, as it were, the powers of darkness in a low public house. 
so he may not really have thought God was imminent in everything. There's a little bit of what's alleged to be the alienation of Edward Hopper's famous Nighthawks in this. Gauguin then finally did arrive in Arles and began staying with Van Gogh in the Yellow House in October of 1888. For some time they got along well enough. Van Gogh was especially impressed by Gauguin's cooking. However, by December they were having trouble getting along, more I think simply because they were both geniuses than anything else. In fact, the two months they spent in the Yellow House may set a record for two geniuses living together without trying to kill each other. In any case, according to Gauguin, it was shortly after he painted this picture of Van Gogh at work that things began to get out of control. And again, according to Gauguin, Van Gogh said the painting made him look like he'd gone crazy. The subject Van Gogh is painting here is one of the versions of his sunflower pictures, which have always been among his most popular. This is the terrace of another cafe at night. Both this picture and the one we saw of the cafe interior a few minutes ago were painted in September shortly before Gauguin arrived. Anyway, the night after Gauguin painted that picture of Van Gogh at this or some other cafe, Van Gogh threw a glass of absinthe at him, and the next night, apparently the 23rd of December, he came at him with a straight razor, but then turned around, ran back to the house, cut off his ear, or at least part of it, with the razor and sent it to a prostitute, as we've heard. This is the way that view looks today. The cafe was restored some time ago to look more like it did in Van Gogh's day. To continue the story, the prostitute reported this gift to the police, who took Van Gogh to the local hospital the next morning. Gauguin wrote Theo about what had happened, and he came to Arles immediately and visited Van Gogh in the hospital, as did Madame Genoux here, who was the proprietress of the night cafe, and whose portrait by Van Gogh this is. She also had her portrait painted by Gauguin. Joseph Roulin, another visitor, was the local postmaster who had befriended Van Gogh and had his portrait painted. This is Dr. Felix Ray, who was very kind and attempted to treat Van Gogh at the hospital, but who did not think much of him as an artist. In a later interview, he describes himself as having been horrified by this portrait of him. It is said that Ray gave the picture to his mother, who used it to cover a hole in her chicken coop. This is Van Gogh's self-portrait with his bandaged ear, now back in the Yellow House on or about January 7, 1889. Theo had to return to Paris, and Gauguin went with him and never saw Van Gogh again. But Van Gogh was not in good shape. He suffered from hallucinations, accused people of trying to poison him, and was in and out of the hospital over the next two months. Finally, his neighbors became so fed up with his behavior that the police required he be hospitalized and the house closed. He was placed in the private asylum, which occupied the former monastery of Saint Paul de Mazol, which you see here in the town of San Remy, about 20 miles from Arles, with Theo paying the bills. This is the cloister. Van Gogh was also treated very sympathetically here and soon was allowed supervised excursions. His letters to Theo and others don't betray any obvious signs of madness or even depression. He seems to have suffered what he called attacks, but otherwise seems to have been perfectly okay. Several of his most well-known pictures were painted while he was at San Remy, including Starry Night, which we'll see shortly, and which he sent to Theo to be exhibited at the Salon des Artistes Independents. He also had pictures shown in Brussels with the Levant group. The Red Vineyard, which he also painted here, is, however, probably the only picture actually sold during his lifetime. In May of 1890, Van Gogh was allowed to move to Auvers, a suburb of Paris to the northwest. Dr. Gachet there had been recommended to Vincent and Theo by Pizarro, and an amateur artist himself, he had treated several other artists and owned pictures by Cezanne and Pizarro. 
Van Gogh lived during this time in the Ravu Inn, which still stands there. This is a portrait now of Dr. Cachet, whom Van Gogh thought was every bit as off-balance as he himself was. Despite that, or maybe because of it, they became very close during the three months Van Gogh was his patient. During the last two months of his life or so, Van Gogh painted an average of about a picture a day, and many of these are now considered to be among his most important, and certainly they're among his most familiar. We're going to see some of the pictures Van Gogh painted now in the last year of his life, while we hear something by Charles Gounod. We saw a portrait of him by Angre a few weeks ago. This one is by a fellow named Henri Lehmann, who was a pupil of Angre. A couple of things Gounod wrote are more well known than his name. One is the March of the Marionettes, which was used as the theme for Alfred Hitchcock's TV show, and the other is the setting of Ave Maria. The 19th century was not a great century for religion in any of the arts, as I've said, including music. But Gounod, who was a fervent Catholic his whole life, even though his greatest commercial success was with his opera Faust, part of which we heard in connection with the Paris Opera, did write what many regard to be as at least one of the rare impressive settings of the Mass by a French composer in the 19th century. This is the Gloria from the St. Cecilia Mass. He painted this self-portrait the last year of his life. And this is Starry Night, painted just a few months before his death. After he moved to Auvergne, he spent a lot of his time painting the fields around the town. This is another example. detail from that. Another example. On the 27th of July, 1890, he walked out into one of these fields and shot himself, but missed his heart and was able to walk back to the inn and up to his room where he died two days later. This is Van Gogh's room in the Albert's Revue. It has recently been argued that Vincent did not in fact kill himself, but was rather shot by a local boy who had been tormenting him because of his weird behavior, and that he did not report this because he didn't want the boy prosecuted. There are also conflicting reports about his last hours here, who was with him actually at his death, and so on. This is a picture by Van Gogh of the church in Auvergne, near which he was to be buried. Theo was never the same after Vincent's death and died himself at just 33. He was later reburied next to Vincent in the Auvergne churchyard. This is usually said to be his last painting. In one of his last letters to Theo, he wrote, One day or another, I believe I will find a way to have an exhibition of my own 
in a cafe somewhere. This is his last self-portrait. And there's another important tombstone, and that's where we'll start in the fall.